of showing green. Alrighty. Huh? It did. Alrighty. That's what I get for trying to hope that everything will be alright, right? So the bad thing is, is a whole bunch of people shared the original video and it was just the song. But that's okay. So we're back on. Kind of. It's spotty. So I wonder. We might have to go back to 6.30. I don't like that, but if need be, we will be. Alrighty. <clears throat> well, at least if it's showing yellow. It says it's green, but it's Okay. Alright, well, if it's green, then, then it should be good. Um, I don't know, we'll see what happens. Anyway, well, if you're watching, thanks for watching. Uh, if you watch this later, thanks for watching. Um, apparently, maybe we need to go back to six yellow. yellow. Maybe we need to. Yeah. Maybe we need to go back to 6 30 start time. I don't really want to, but if we need to, we will. Yeah. It's going to do the same thing as yellow. It says it did last week. Okay. Whatever you want to do. Well, we'll just keep going. Um, so, this is what you deal with with technology, and you try to do this, and technology doesn't work all the time. Um, but, we'll keep on going. So, we're continuing on in the series of lessons uh, we did a long, long time ago dealing with what we believe and why. And we started off talking about the fact that there's a gospel that you can believe, uh, there's a Bible that you can trust, a Bible study you can understand, and a life that you can live. Um, then what we've wanted to do is we've, we've wanted to add a couple more. One's a purpose that you can fulfill, and then the final one, final in the series is going to be uh, a hope that sustains, or a hope that can sustain you. Uh, so we're, we're, we should be able to finish up this evening with the purpose you can fulfill. And I know it's probably spotty on Facebook right now, and if you're sticking with us, we appreciate it. And if not, we can watch a little bit later on, and hopefully, hopefully everything will be all right next time. All right. <clears throat> So, what we're going to do, we're going to start off this evening the same place we've started off each, each of these times uh, with Proverbs chapter 20 and Proverbs chapter 15. So, if you're not there, um, go ahead and turn to Proverbs chapter 20 and then Proverbs chapter 15. <clears throat> and this is, this is a lot different than uh, years ago. Most of you probably remember Rick Warren did a purpose-filled life and a purpose-filled church, and he made tons and tons of money off of false doctrine, much like a lot of those guys do. Um, what we want to let you know is there is actually a purpose that God has for you, and you can fulfill it. And it's not living in a big house, and it's not living um, with a three-car garage filled with Ferraris or Corvettes or whatever your choice of vehicle is. Um, it's not having everything that you want, gold and all this other stuff. That's not, that's not the life and the purpose that God has for you. Your purpose is, is quite simple. Our purpose is quite simple. Our purpose is to, to be ambassadors for Christ. And that's where we left off last time going through 2 Corinthians chapter 5, dealing with the fact that we are ambassadors. And that's, that's a thing that God's given us. It's a title that God's given us. It's a position that God's given us here that we can fulfill today. And part of being an ambassador is going out to the world and telling them that they need to be reconciled to God. And what we do is we, you know, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4 tells us that it's God's will that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And that's what we're here to do, to make sure that we have a gospel that people can believe. And that's the gospel that gets them saved. And that's the, 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 the fact that Jesus Christ died for your sins was buried and rose again the third day. And when we place our faith in that and that alone, 
uh, that's the, the moment that we place our faith and, and trust in that and that alone. We're placed into living union with Christ. We're baptized into Christ. We're, we, we have that circumcision after the operation of the faith of God. All those things take place. You're regenerated. You're indwelt by the Father, indwelt by the Son, indwelt by the Holy Spirit. You're sealed until the day of redemption. And so then one of the things that, that we think about and that we talk about here is that all those things take place the moment that you get saved and a lot of us don't even know about it. And it's not until years later, months later, that we come to the knowledge of the truth of what God's actually done for us that, at the moment that we get saved. But that's what we're here to do. It's to let other people know this is what this is what you need to do to be saved, and that's just simply trust in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And the problem is, is first you've got to let them know that they're lost. And the only way that you can get a person found or, or saved is to let them know that they're lost. And the way you do that is you go through the gospel of Christ, and you start off in Romans chapter 1, and you let them know, here's who you are as an unsaved person. And then you bring them to Christ through the, through the truth and the knowledge or through the truth that we have through the scriptures. And at that moment, we get saved. And then God places us in a position of an ambassador here on the earth to represent him. And so that's one of those things that we're going to be able to take a look at and talk about tonight. Our, our purpose doesn't just end here. All right, so well, what I want to do is let's read, let's read Proverbs chapter 20 and, verse, and chapter 15 as well. And, and we'll get this going uh, as, as we look through. So notice Proverbs chapter 20, verse 18. He says, Every purpose is established by counsel, and with good advice make war. Uh, Proverbs chapter 15, verse 22. He says, Without counsel, purposes are disappointed, but in the multitude of counselors they are established. Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to study your word. As we open up your word and, and try to find out what your purpose is and the things that you're doing today in the, in, in the dispensation of the grace of God, that we can be a part of it. And it's something that we can do. It's not something that uh, it's, it's unattainable or we don't know exactly what you're doing. We know exactly what you're doing today in this dispensation. And our, our hope and prayer is that we actually take this information, study it out for ourselves, and find out what our purpose is, and get on with the work that we might be able to be to, to be to the praise and the honor of your glory and your grace and your Son, Jesus Christ, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. So when we look, and we've started off with this in Proverbs chapter 20, verse 18, he says, Every purpose is established by counsel, and with good advice make war. So when we look at this, every purpose is established by counsel. Now, when we take a look at Proverbs 15, verse 22, he says, Without counsel, purposes are disappointed. But in the multitude of counselors, they are established. So when we take a look at a purpose, a purpose is established how? Well, pur a purpose, every purpose is established by counsel. And the way that, 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 that it's established is by a multitude of counselors. All right? So when we take a look at this, really what, what's going on is in your Bible, what God's doing today is fulfilling and, and bringing to fulfillment bringing to fruition a purpose that he started off with before the foundation of the world. Now, a lot of times we, we get caught up in, 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 you know, what we're doing here on the earth. And, and most churches out there, they, they dwell on this is what's taking place in the earth, and this is what we're doing. God wants to do things here on the earth, and God wants to bless me with a house and bless me with a car and bless me with a job, whatever it may be. Our goal is to be ambassadors to represent Christ here on the earth. And what God's done is he's already established that purpose by the multitude of counselors. And that multitude of counselors, we've gone through 1 John and, and some other passages and found out that it's the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's one God and three persons. They established a purpose before the foundation of the world and they made a promise to one another. There, you know, when you know everybody, everybody's always looking for well, um, some sort of promise that God's given them. Really, really, the only promise that that matters is the fact that the the the, the Godhead promised to themselves 
that they were going to fulfill a purpose and they established that purpose. So what I want to do is let's go get a couple things real quick. First, get First Timothy chapter two, and we'll 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 get this going. So First Timothy chapter two, in verse four. In verse 3 he says, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, which in the context there he's talking about uh, supplications of prayer and intercessions and things like that being made for all men especially. And he says in, in verse 2, For kings, and they're all in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and honesty. And he says, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Notice verse 4, Who will have all men to be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth. So when we take a look at this, verse 4 tells us that this is God's will. God desires that all men be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth. Now, the problem is, is what people do is they come along with their, with their theological systems and they say, well, God's will is always going to happen no matter what. Well, do you know people that are not saved? Yes. So then God's will doesn't always come to pass as far as this but the purpose that he has for the heaven and the earth will come to pass now now one of those things when, when and we talked about the last time people get caught up in the uh, the sovereignty of God and they talk about the sovereignty of God and one of the things we mentioned is the fact that that word sovereignty is not found in the King James Bible at all it's found in the newer versions or perversions It's found in those newer versions and one of the things we talked about is that that name sovereign, that title sovereign, is actually one of the 99 names that Islam has for Allah, or Allah. And so then, when you talk about that, really what they what what they end up promoting when they talk about the sovereign God is really they're 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 promoting Islam. They don't even really know it. But what people have this idea about is that everything that in life. God has designed that to happen that particular way at that particular time. Now, the other night, <clears throat> we had this little tiny cricket. I was telling Delilah about this. We had this really tiny cricket, almost to the point you couldn't even see it. So Monday night, I see this on the, on the door sill, and I thought I, I thought I killed it. Well, that night, it came back with a vengeance. And it was the loudest and highest pitched noise I've ever heard from a cricket. And it, it was driving me crazy. Well, I finally find him again, and then I lose him. And he just, he just kept on going. So some people would say that it was God's will that I not kill that cricket that night and it was going to do what it's going to do. That, that's, how, that's how ridiculous some of those things get. And people allow that thought process to lead and guide in everything that they do. Well, you know, the whole idea of all things happen for a reason. And they say, well, God's got a purpose for it. Well, <clears throat> right here we've got a thing that says it's God's will that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. That's what God wants to happen. But he has equipped you and I with a free will to make decisions whether or not we actually do get saved or not. And if we choose to get saved, he's given us the free will to say you can come to the truth or you can come to the knowledge of the truth or you don't or you can't. And it's up to you. He will not dictate and overpower your will in any situation ever. So the idea when we talk about that God has a purpose the purpose is it found in each individual little detail of your life. There's an overall purpose that God has for the, for the heavens and for the earth. And none of them have to do with that cricket. And when we, when we, when we just step back and allow God's word to take care of itself, when you go and study election, you go and study predestination, which we're going to take a look at a couple of those phrases tonight. When you go and study foreknowledge, those words and those terms are so misused in theology. Not just, it's been happening for years, so it's nothing new. But it's being so misused today, and people are just eating it up with a spoon. 
Because what happens is, is if it's God's, if, if God is directing everything and you, you get drunk and you get in a car wreck, well, it was God's plan. And it takes, it takes all responsibility and all accountability off of you. And the, the, the sad part about it is, is I hear these same people talking about accountability buddies. And you've got to have so-and-so be accountable to, to this other person. And they're a great person to be accountable to. Well, if you say everything is designed by God and everything that happens in life is because God's designed it and he's, he's desired that to happen, then why would you have an accountability person? It just doesn't make sense. So when we look at this, it's God's will that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. So what we want to do is find out what God's will is and go be a part of it. And if we're out trying to get people to, be get, to get saved and then come to the knowledge of the truth, then we're in God's will. So you figure out what God's doing and you go do that. So go get 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And again, this is where we, where we left off last time. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, what Paul's doing is he's laying out for us what, it's, what it is that we're to be, and that's ambassadors. Notice in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, <clears throat> notice in verse 18. He says, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. So right here in verse 20, he says, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. What he's saying is he's saying, We, we, we have been... We, we've been named as ambassadors for Christ. And what we go out is with the word of reconciliation and this ministry of reconciliation, and we go tell people that they need to be reconciled to God. And the best part about it is, is God's made it possible for you not to be reconciled to Him because of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And you see in verse 21, For He hath made Him, talking about Christ, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, again, talking about Christ, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. So when we're in Christ, we are made the righteousness of God. So what God is doing today is He's saying, I'm going to take people and I'm going to take them out of Adam and place them into Christ the moment that they trust in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And at that time, they're going to be reconciled, and he's no longer going to, to impute our sins to us. You go over and read in Romans chapter 4, and Paul's telling us exactly what that is. And he even mentions David. He says, David describes the blessedness of a man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Well, when you look at that, what, what he's doing is he's saying, David describes the blessedness of the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. So you go back and find out a little bit about David and what David was doing. He, he could describe it. You and I can live it today of not having our sins imputed to us. And that's an amazing truth that a lot of people get confused on and, and, and try to do some other things with. But what God's doing today is the moment that you get saved, you are made the righteousness of God in Him and He reconciles you and forgives you and justifies you and glorifies you. Go to Romans chapter 8, and that's exactly what he talks about. And so those are those things that we want to make sure that we see. In fact, let's go take a look at that real quick. Go over to Romans chapter 8. When, when we start taking a look at just exactly what, what God's done for us, it's not just about what we do here on this earth. Now, what we do here on this earth is important. Otherwise... The moment that we get saved, God would take us up. So the fact that you get saved and you're still on earth, that means that there's something here that you need to be doing. And one of those things is to go get people saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Go be an ambassador. Go and teach these people this, this gospel. Notice in Romans chapter 8, um, verse, starting verse, verse 28, he says... 
And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. Now, when we take a look at this purpose, this is a verse that's so misunderstood, <clears throat> much like a lot of other verses, but this is a verse that's so misunderstood. Notice he says, And we know all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. And they say, See? Everything in life happens for a reason, and God has a reason for it to take place, and it's all according to His purpose. Well, if you look at the context of what's going on, the all things, if you go take a look at the all things, <clears throat> um, I mean, you can, you can back all the way up. You look at verse 18, chapter 8, verse 18 says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption and the glorious liberty into the glorious liberty of the children of God. So if you look at the all things here, the all things in, in have to deal with what? Sufferings of the, of the present time, the glory that shall be revealed in us, the earnest expectation, uh, the fact that we're the, the creatures waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God, the fact that um, the verse 21 says, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of, of, of the children of God. And you go down through there, and the whole creation growing up travaileth and in pain together until now. And we have this adoption that we have in verse 23, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. And we come on down, and then in verse 26, he says, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth with our infirmities, for we know not what, what we should pray for as we ought. And then you get down in verse um, 20, 28, and he says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that, that love God, to them that are called according to His purpose. You look at all the stuff prior to this, and those are the all things. All the things that we just got through talking about. The sufferings of this present time. The glory that shall be revealed in us. All these things. There's a purpose that God has that God established before the foundation of the world. And we'll take a look at that here in just a little bit. There's a purpose that, God's, that God established. And God's going to bring those things to pass. And everything in our life is going to prepare us for that. That does not mean that God's designed each and every one of those little things in our life to take place. But the ultimate goal is to do what? Well, we'll take a look at that. Notice in verse 29. He says, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate. Notice, that doesn't mean, that word predestinate, you, you look at that, the root word there is destiny. And God has predetermined the destiny of the church the body of Christ. Not each individual person, but God has predestined, He has, dest he has, he has pre-planned the destiny of the church the body of Christ to do what? Now a lot of people look at this and they say predestinate. Predestinate means God's pre-planned before the foundation of the world that you get saved or not. And that's what that sovereignty of God and the, the election and all that, all that nonsense that people misuse words. Notice what is he predestinated us to be. Notice he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. That's what God's predestinated us to be. To be conformed to the image of his son. Why? That we, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. What did he predestinate us to do? As the church, as members of the church of the body of Christ, is he's predestinated us to do what? To be conformed to the image of Christ. That's not that's not to get saved. That's taking saved people and, and conforming them to the image of Christ. And the way he does that is through his word. You go over to Romans chapter 12 and you find out, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. What we do is we come to a verse that's different than what we've been taught and we believe the verse rather than what we've been taught and we change our mind and we start believing the verse and what happens is our mind is transformed after 
the image of Christ. And what happens is, is we become more conformed to the image of Christ. Now, the ultimate goal is that you're going to be completely and totally conformed to the image of Christ one day. Not now. You're not going to do that now. You're not going to be perfect now. You're not going to be doing... I mean, that's something that God's going to do at that adoption. We'll talk about that again here in a little bit. Notice verse 30. Moreover, whom he did predestinate. Predestinate to what? To be conformed to the image of his Son. Then he also called... Now, again, that's another one of those words, called. When you take a look at that word called, people say, well, God called them, God chose them, God elected them, and they misuse that. Really, when you, when you, when you go through this, notice, and whom he, and, and them, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. If you take a look at all these things, they're past tense. Notice in verse 30 it says, Moreover whom he did predestinate, them he also called. So in God's mind, he's already established his purpose and the, count, and the, the, the multitude of counselors, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, chose among themselves the promise to themselves that they would redeem the heaven and the earth through the instrumentality of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And it's one of those things, I was listening to a message this past week uh, from John Verstegen, Verstegen, and he was talking about, it, it's, almost, it's almost like the, 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 the Godhead is they're trying to outdo how much they love the others. And I got to thinking about that. It, 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 it's kind of a weird thing to think about, but really... They, they live for each other. And, and that's, that's the way that we should be. And so when we think about this, their, their whole purpose is to, or I should say, his whole purpose in the three persons is to do what? Glorify each other in, in eternity. Where? In the heaven and in the earth. And this is, this is what's going to be a part. We get to be a part of it. That's the best part, is we get to be a part of it. He says, and, and moreover, whom he did predestinate, then he also called, and whom he called, then he also justified, and, then, and whom he justified, then he also glorified. What shall we say then to these things? Well, what things? All the things we had there. If God be for us, who can be against us? When we take a look at what's going on in the issue of what, what's taking place here, and you look, you go down to verse 30, he says, or verse 35, he says, Who shall separate, separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecutions or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? And you go down through it. Verse 38 says, For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. When, when we're taken and placed and taken out of Adam and placed into Christ, all these things are now true. The moment that you get placed into Christ, you now are predetermined and predestined to do something. And as soon as you're placed in there, you are called. Every time you take a look at that, that elect and things like that. You're, you're the elect. It's not to salvation. It's to service. We get to be. A, we get to serve God, and and He's not only that, but He's justified us, and He's glorified us. Why? To glorify His Son. That's what God chose in and of himself, of his own free will, to do. And he allows you and I to become part of that glorification process. And, and it's an amazing thing because as we go through here, all these things, and honestly, this is, this is one of those series that could probably never end. But of course, it, it has to. When we take a look at these things, 
that's the issue that I want us to be able to see. Notice, jump back to Romans chapter 8, verse 14. Romans chapter 8, verse 14. He says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but, we, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. So he's talking to saved people. He says, you've received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Notice, the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. So the moment that we get saved, we get placed into the family of God. Now, adoption, scripturally, is different than adoption in the world. The adoption in the world is you take somebody outside your family and you bring them into your family and you say, well, you're part of my family. Well, what this does, what God does, is he says, I want to bring you in to Christ, and now you're a child. You're, notice he says here that we are the children of God. All right? So the moment that we can say we become children of God, notice in verse 17. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. So one of the things that we get is we are, we are heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. So everything that God gives to his son, we get access to. We get as joint heirs. And you think about, you go, you go and study out what Christ's, uh, what his what his inheritance is. I can't think of the word. You go find out what his inheritance is and we get to be a part of that. But notice, <clears throat> when we look at this, we have, we have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry out of a father. We are children of God and if we're children then we're heirs, heirs of God and join heirs with Christ automatically. And again, this is another one of the verses we could get into because you got this sonship idea that you're not really complete in Christ until you go and do things to become more complete, and that's just, that's not true. You're an heir of God and a joint heir with Christ the moment that you get saved. And so then when we take a look at this, that spirit of adoption, we just read about it a little bit ago. Drop down to verse 23. He says, and not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption. Notice, here's the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. So when we take a look at what's going on here, what is it that we need to, be, to, have, to, to have fixed? Hold your place there. Go to Ephesians chapter 2. <clears throat> Go to Ephesians chapter 2. When, when we look at what's going on, in Ephesians chapter 2, notice in verse 1 he says, And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of the world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, and he goes on down from there, talking about our conversation in times past. He's Notice in verse 1, And you hath he quickened. Our spirit is dead, our soul is darkened, and our flesh is the flesh. The moment that we get saved, our spirit is given life, our soul is given light, and our flesh is cut away from both of those. So the only thing that's left that needs to be fixed or changed is in Romans chapter 8, where he says, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. This flesh one day, we will take this flesh off. You go to 1 Corinthians 15, you read a little bit about the fact that Paul reveals a mystery about the catching away of the church, the body of Christ, when this mortal will put on immortality and this corruptible shall put on incorruption and you go on through there. And he talks about that. That's the last part. We are spirit, soul, and body. God has, God has given life to the spirit, light to the soul, and one day he's going to redeem this body. And what's going to happen, that's that adoption. When God declares us his sons. You know, when, when, 
when Christ at his resurrection. We go over to Acts and we, we go back to, to Psalm 2 and we find out that that was the time. His resurrection is when God said, Thou art my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And so we're part of the beloved. We are accepted in the beloved according to Ephesians. We're accepted in the beloved. And one day God is going to say to you and I, about you and I, that we are beloved just like he did Christ. Not because of us, but because of who we are in Christ. That's something that we automatically get. And then it will be in whom I am well pleased. God will be well pleased with you one day. Now you look at your life now and you think there's no way. But God will be pleased with you one day because you know, you go over to Philippians, he talks about he that hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Christ. God's begun a work in you the moment that you got saved and that, that work is in your inner man by taking in sound doctrine and applying that sound doctrine to your soul, believing it, allowing that to become part of you, allowing the word of Christ to dwell in you richly. And what happens is the spirit starts to, to live in and through you and it starts producing the fruit of the Spirit. And so what happens is, is those things are the works of God. God is working in and through you when we believe the words on the page. Now God's, God's not going to, again, overpower your will and make you do things. He, he leaves it up to you and I. When, <clears throat> when we go over to Galatians, we, we read a little bit more about that adoption. And we find out that, that, that a child differeth nothing from a servant. But when you become a full-grown adult, you start acting different, living different, and, and thinking differently. And all those things just automatically come about when we actually get in the book. God's Spirit does not work apart from God's Word. You know, we talked about it this past Sunday. A lot of people get their little five-year-old, eight-year-old, ten-year-old son. They'll put them up on a on the the stage at a church, and that little kid will just repeat all the same stuff that he's already always heard. That kid's not read scripture. He's not studied it out. That's not the Holy Spirit working through him. That's the flesh producing a fleshly thing to invoke fleshly responses and that's not that's not how God works today let's take a look at let's take a look at a couple other things real quick go to Ephesians <clears throat> get Ephesians chapter 1 when when we talk about what God's purpose is for you and I today our purpose here on the earth is to be ambassadors to go get people saved and bring them to the knowledge of the truth well that doesn't end there. Notice in Ephesians chapter 1. Um, <clears throat> let's take a look at verse. Start off in verse 3. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. According to us, he hath chosen us in him, notice, before the foundation of the world. Now again, that word chosen doesn't mean that God supernaturally picked out certain people and said you're going to be saved and you're not that's not what he's talking about what he's saying is he hath chosen us where in him not to be in him but he hath chosen us in him so in in order to be chosen in order to be called in order to be predestined in order to be justified in order to be glorified in order to be forgiven of sins and all those other things, you have to be in Him. The moment you get in Him, you become the chosen. <laughs> and what, notice what he says, According as He hath chosen us in Him, when? Before the foundation of the world. God has a plan to do something that He chose to do before the foundation of the world. And it wasn't revealed until it was revealed to and through the Apostle Paul. And now you and I get to be a part of it. Notice, 
that we, here's, here's what he's wanted us and, pre, and, and called us to be and chosen us to be, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Do you know what he's going to do? He's going to make you holy and without blame before him in love. Why? Because you're in Christ. He's going to perform that. Now, you tell me what your sock choice or what that cricket has anything to do with us being holy and without blame, a work that God's going to do and perform in us. And one day when we go up in the rapture and we are caught up together to meet Christ in the air and he takes it and we go before the Bema seat or the, the uh, judgment seat of Christ and we go before him and he presents unto us all the things that they that, that the Spirit's done in and through us, and He presents us with the with the rank and authority that we are given to go and glorify Him, and He goes and presents us to God the Father as holy and without blame. That's something that He's going to do. That's the purpose. And we see this, notice, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to Himself, notice, according to the good pleasure of His will. So the good pleasure of his will matches the purpose of his will that he's going to do this. We see this. Keep on going. Verse 6. To the praise of the glory of his grace. That's what it's all about. To the praise of the glory of his grace wherein he hath made us accepted, notice, in the beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Again, how do you get forgiveness of sins? You have to be in him. Notice, according to the riches of His grace, wherein He hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of His will, according to His good pleasure, which He hath, notice, purposed in Himself. God's purpose is to glorify each other. The, the, the Godhead, that's their purpose. And the way that he's going to do that is through the mystery of his will, according to the good, his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself. The purpose that God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit chose to do in among themselves and promised to each other that they were going to fulfill, they're going to do that. Notice verse 10, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated, notice, according to the purpose of him who, who, met, who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Why, Paul? That we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. What God's going to do is he's going to give you an opportunity to get saved. Let's say you take that opportunity. Alright, so now he's going to give you the opportunity to come into the knowledge of the truth. And when you come to the knowledge of the truth, you're going to find out that you are complete in Christ. That you are sealed in Christ. You, you have all these things. You're blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. There's, there's nothing lacking in your life. God has done everything through the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And He's begun a good work and He's going to perform it. Why? So that He can glorify His Son. He's doing it for His Son. And we see that. That's, that's the purpose of what's going on. They're there to glorify one another. Jump over to Ephesians chapter 3. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 8. We'll jump into the, the verses here. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 8. He says, Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Notice, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. Notice, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ. So when we take a look at this, this fellowship of the mystery is something that has been kept secret or hid in God from the beginning of the world. 
So before the foundation of the world, God the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, the Trinity, the, the Godhead, decides among themselves that they have a purpose. And those, those counselors, the multitude of counselors, establish that purpose. And part of that purpose was purposely kept secret from the beginning of the world. You go to Romans 16, you find that. You see it here. You go over to Colossians 1, you see that. There are things that God kept secret, hid in Himself, for a particular reason. Because had Satan and his angels known it, they would not have crucified Jesus Christ. The crucifixion of Jesus Christ is what makes all that possible. The purpose that the, that the Godhead purposed within themselves and promised among themselves is going to come to pass because of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Now notice, verse 10. Why is he doing this? Notice, to the intent. Why is he, why is he wanting us to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery? By the way, there's a fellowship that God the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit have and we get to be a part of that fellowship. What is the fellowship of the mystery? And what happens is God the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit chose to do something and they're in a fellowship together to produce this for the glory of each other. And we get to be a part of it. And what we're to do is to make all men see. They're going to be able to see the life of God living in and through us. That's what it means when God talks about the mystery of godliness. How God has purposed and chosen to be manifest in this flesh that we have. Notice, what is, why does He want us to, to make all men see? What is the fellowship of the mystery? Notice verse 10, to the intent, here's the purpose, that now under the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. God has a purpose, and through that wisdom and the multitude of counselors established that purpose, kept part of it back, and allowed us to be a part of this to unfold the multifaceted or the manifold wisdom of God. And we get to be a part of it. And this is something that God decided before the foundation of the world that they were going to do, that He was going to do. And we get to be a part of what God's doing. Notice, <clears throat> keep on going, in verse, verse 12, in whom, that's Christ, we have boldness and access with confidence. Notice, by the faith of Him, Wherefore I desire that you faint not at my tribulations for you, which is, which is your glory. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Notice, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to, the, that, to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye be rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and the, de and the length and the depth and the height, and to know the love of Christ, which, passes, which passeth, passeth all knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, Unto Him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without the end. Amen. When you read that verse 20, and He says, Now unto Him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. When in your lifetime, and everybody takes that verse and says, Well, if you think that God's going to give you um, your favorite car, then He's going to give you an even better one. Um, you know, whatever, I mean, people misuse that all the time. He's like, whatever you think you can do, God's going to give you more. Well, how many of you would have ever thought that God would grant to you, according to the rich of His glory, to be strengthened with His might on the, by the Spirit in the inner man? How many of us would have ever thought that Christ would dwell in our hearts by faith, 
that we would be able to be rooted and grounded in love, that we would be able to comprehend the, the, with all of the saints the breadth and the length and the depth and the height and to know the love of Christ which passeth passes from the knowledge uh, uh, that we might be filled with the fullness of God. How many of you have ever thought about that you would be able to be that you would be filled with the fullness of God? You go over to Colossians and you find out you are complete in Him. And you just take a look at that real quick. Go over to Colossians <clears throat> chapter 1. I love verse 10. But I want you to think of something real quick. The, the, issue, the issue in the, in the, in the context here, you know, Paul starts off talking about in, in verse 6, says you've received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him. Being rooted and grounded and built, or rooted and established, rooted and built up and established in, in the faith. He's, in verse 8, he's talking about Christ. Notice in verse 9. Now, I love, I love Colossians 1.10, and, and, and a lot of people use that, but I want you to notice in verse 9, notice, For in him, Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Now, I want you to think about that for a second. In Christ, in him, dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Okay? Wrap your mind around that for a second. So when Paul talks about the fact that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that by being rooted and grounded in love, you can understand and comprehend the depth and length and the height and the breadth, and to know the love of Christ. When, when you talk about that the, the, the his prayer for the Ephesians was that Christ may dwell in their hearts, when we think about that, Christ is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And in verse 10 he says, And ye are complete in Him. Now if Christ is the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you're in Him, you just sit and think about that real quick. You are complete in Him, in the one who is the one where... It in him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And then people sit back, woe is me, and I wonder what God has in store for this flat tire and things like that. I mean, honestly, you don't understand Colossians 1, 9, and 10. You are complete in the one in whom the fullness of the Godhead dwelleth bodily. And you're complete in him. You're lacking nothing. When we, when we take a look at what God's purpose is, God's purpose is really to what? To glorify His Son. And glorify the Spirit. What's the, what's the Son's purpose? To glorify the Father and to glorify the Spirit. What's the Spirit's purpose? To glorify the Father and to glorify the Son. They exist to glorify one another. God, one God in three persons, manifested to glorify each other member of the Godhead. And then you read a thing over in Romans 8 where he talks about the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed in us. And you think, you think, you sit back and think about that. As we go through and we find out a little bit more and more about who we are in Christ and allow that to be the issue and the whole purpose is that it might be according to His good pleasure 